Um, thank you so much. We're now going to turn to uh, uh, a discussion uh, very much in keeping with Senator Murkowski's uh, conversation about the need for economic growth and the importance of energy and resource development. Um, and we are going to turn to a panel that I will tell you a secret. All four of us on this panel have one thing in common. We probably have a lot more than that, but I at least know one thing we have in common. And that is we all participated in the National Petroleum Council's Arctic Research Study. Um, I was just a supporting cast member on the uh, subcommittee work, uh, Drew uh, also as well, but our, our co-captains on this uh, subcommittee were none other than Carol Lloyd uh, from ExxonMobil and Paula Grant from the Department of Energy. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna briefly introduce our wonderful power panel uh, and to talk a little bit about the study, which was released uh, on March 27th. I know Carol and other colleagues have done some uh, outreach about the study. So you may know a little bit about it. You may have never heard about it, but we, we wanted to share with you this study, but more importantly, talk about a broader array of uh, Arctic energy-related issues, um, and maybe going a little bit beyond the study. And we're so grateful to have Drew Pierce here, who is very engaged with the newly formed Arctic Economic Council, and she's promised to give some new insights uh, into that. But before I begin, let me let me introduce this wonderful and distinguished panel. Immediately to my left, Dr. Paula Grant is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Oil and Natural Gas in the Department of Energy's Office of Fossil Energy, um, where she administers both domestic and international oil and gas programs. Uh, she previously uh, worked at the American Gas Association and Duke Energy, and also she has a very impressive uh, academic background. To the far left, we have Ms. Carol Lloyd, who's the engineering vice president at ExxonMobil's Upstream Research Company. Uh, she's also a long distinguished career, uh, both with engineering manager at ExxonMobil, but also engineering manager at Imperial Oil. And she is the smartest person on technology I have ever met. So if you have some real technical, write to her, write to her. And finally, to my right, we have Ms. Drew Pierce, senior policy advisor at Cromwell and Mooring's uh, Environment and Natural Resources and Government Affairs Group. Drew is an Alaskan, and she has been a senior advisor to two former secretaries of the Interior on a range of, of issues, specifically with Alaskan affairs. She also was appointed by President George W. Bush as the first federal coordinator in the office of the federal coordinator for Alaska Natural Gas Transportation Projects. Shoo! That's yes. a title. That's a mouthful. <laughs> but uh, Drew uh, is a legislator. She served for 17 years in the Alaskan State Legislature, and she's uh, going to help us give a very powerful perspective from the state of Alaska. So we have some great slides. Uh, each of the panelists have a short presentation. We're going to begin with Paula from the Department of Energy's uh, uh, perspective, turn to Carol for the uh, industry perspective. Drew's going to do cleanup, and then we're going to ask some questions and welcome you into it. So with that, again, thank you. Welcome, Paula. The floor is yours. Thanks, Heather. It's a pleasure to be here today, and uh, thanks, everyone, for coming in from this beautiful spring day. Uh, I'm very pleased to see that spring has finally arrived here in D.C. Um, I think it was actually warmer in Alaska when we were in Juneau last week than it was here in D.C. So um, it's a, a funny world. But uh, we're really thrilled to have the opportunity to talk about the Arctic and Alaska and our oil and gas resources here today. It's a, a very uh, important moment in our history as, as we think about the Arctic. And I want to share a little bit of the administration's perspective on uh, sort of where our, where our head is right now on the Arctic. I, I think uh, many of you know, because you're in the room here focused on the Arctic, that the president has set a, a national uh, imperative for the, the U.S. to take a leadership role in ensuring stewardship of the Arctic, as set out in the national strategy for the Arctic a couple of years ago in the following implementation plan. The, uh, our leadership and our, our presence in the region will be vital over the coming decade to ensuring continued U.S leadership and in setting um, standards of behavior, norms of behavior, and activity in the region. And um, the, as the, the climate changes and sea ice begins to um, 
be less prevalent in some areas and move around more in other areas, we're seeing an increased amount of activity in the Arctic, either from a commercial perspective and a, a significant increase in shipping activity or from a, a military perspective with uh, demonstrations of activity on other parts, as well as an in increased presence of other countries um, looking at commercial opportunities, even if they aren't Arctic nations, in the region. So there is a tremendous opportunity um, for the United States to, to lead as, uh, as this activity increases. And it's within this context that the Secretary of Energy asked in October of 2013 that the National Petroleum Council conduct uh, a study looking at uh, what is the nature of the oil and gas resource in the Arctic and what are the technologies and practices available and are needed to ensure that those resources are de developed in a prudent manner. And prudent encompasses, and, and as Carol will talk through when she talks through the results of, of the, the research work, prudent encompasses the idea that these resources are valuable and that developing them has both national and energy security benefits, but also these resources must be developed in a manner that minimizes the negative impacts on other natural resources like our air and our land and our water, as well as taking into account um, the benefits that can be accrued to local communities and the knowledge that local communities can contribute to these re the resource development. So it's um, that is the, the question or the request that the Secretary made of the National Petroleum Council. Um, Carol, in a bit, is going to walk you through what, how, how the, the NPC responded to that request. But I want to talk just for a couple of minutes, and um, Heather has admonished me to be brief, um, <laughs> but there's so much to talk about in this area, um, uh, that it, the, the, the Secretary was very pleased to receive the results of the study, as Heather mentioned, on, um, at the end of March. And it's very timely, as uh, many of you know, the U.S. will assume the chairmanship of the Arctic Council um, in the next couple of weeks, actually. And uh, we have an opportunity to work to through our leadership of that council to ensure not only uh, uh, leadership in stewardship of the Arctic environment, but also to uh, find ways to enhance international cooperation. And through the Arctic Council, we have demonstrated an ability to cooperate internationally on science and technology. And that really forms the core of the Secretary's request. It's a, it's a question about what are the science and technologies needed to do ensure the prudent development of oil and gas resources, and in particular, what could the Department of Energy do to further advance science and technology. One of the key aspects of the recommendations that you'll, you'll hear about today is a recognition that in order to develop, to realize the promise presented by our oil and gas resources in Alaska and the Alaskan Arctic, that it will be absolutely vital to secure the public confidence that those resources can be developed in a responsible manner. And in order to ensure that public confidence, we are going to have to uh, make sure that we are conducting science and demonstrating technologies in transparent manners. So that means in some sort of public manner, whether it's through the work of our national labs, we have a network of national labs across the country that are part of the Department of Energy, whether it's through public-private partnerships, many of which are referenced and surveyed in the study, or through academic work. But in order for policymakers to be able to rely on science and technology demonstration in policymaking, that, that work is going to have to be done in a transparent manner that the public can have confidence in. And I think that you'll see quite a few of the recommendations in the study have that in mind. And we very much look forward to identifying ways the Department of Energy can be part of that continued research and that demonstration. Um, the, uh, many will ask why, why the Arctic, why now, um, outside of this, this, uh, this leadership imperative, um, when we have the, such a tremendous abundance of domestic oil and gas in the lower 48. And, uh, the simple answer to that question is that uh, we make we should be making decisions at a policy level that have our children in mind. And the office that I have a, the, the pleasure and the privilege of managing right now, the initial work was done in the Marcellus in 1978 
on horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing. And over the next decade, the office spent about $130 million, much of it in partnership with George Mitchell, who then took it on and, as many of you know, perfected it and uh, demonstrated in the Barnett in North Texas. And that, that knowledge has been applied to a very prolific resource that is found in many parts of this country, um, both natural gas and oil, and has generated an incredible abundance of domestic supply. The reason that we need to be thinking about the Arctic now is because it will take us um, a good decade of exploration and proving up this resource to get into the place where we are um, at a significant level of commercial production. So if you think about the work we did in 1978 to provide for the domestic supplies that we have now, that's where we need to be in the Arctic right now. This is about our children and securing their, their energy security. So that's the why now, why the Arctic. And um, I encourage you all to take a look at the report that Carol's gonna share here in a bit. I think it's a very valuable contribution to our understanding of the oil and gas resource as well, well as the environment in which it will be developed and how we ensure it's done in a prudent manner. So thank you for being here today. Thanks, Heather. Paula, thanks you, thank you so much. I don't mean to be such an ogre in far as time, but I always feel like short presentations and then lots of questions are always the best. So Carol, over to you. Help walk us through some of the highlights of the Petroleum Council's work. Well, good morning, and uh, thank you so very much for the invitation to be here to talk about uh, the Arctic and to talk about the National Petroleum Council study. Um, I uh, would offer for you three key takeaways that, that I'm going to focus on in the next five to seven minutes, and then I'd be pleased to take your questions. The first takeaway is the very collaborative process that was undertaken in this study. Paula mentioned it briefly. Uh, it may be tempting because of the name of the organization under which this study was done to dismiss it as an industry position piece, an industry advocacy document. It is not that, and I hope to uh, demonstrate that to you uh, directly in the next uh, few moments. Um, the second key takeaway is that the U.S. Arctic potential is significant. Material uh, in the future, as Paula so ably articulated to you in her comments about our children, and, and the technology to access to explore for and develop that, that U.S. offshore Arctic potential exists today based on technology that's been developed and proven in other jurisdictions. And then finally, the key takeaway is what happens next. And I'll, I'll close with one of, some of the more important recommendations in the report from a technical perspective. Uh, I'm uh, happy to, to wear the cloak that Heather has given me of the, the technical guru on the, on the panel. So I'll focus on those and then uh, leave uh, Drew Pierce to talk about some of the other aspects which we discussed at great length with regard to the Arctic, Pol or the, uh, Arctic Council and our thoughts on uh, the most appropriate actions uh, to undertake as, as the U.S. Uh, transfers or, or assumes the chairmanship of the Arctic Council. So with that, I'll just make a couple of comments with regard to the team that we assembled and the collaborative process. Uh, in the, in the slide, you can see we had 266 participants from over 105 organizations. 43% uh, of those were from the oil and gas industry, 30% from government, including the federal government uh, here in Washington and also the state of Alaska government representatives, 12% uh, from academic institutions, not surprising given the Secretary's focus on research and technology. We saw the need to reach out to those institutions that were directly involved in research in the Arctic, in ICE, in logistics, in all of these topics which are, were relevant to our report. Uh, the remainder, remaining 15 percent, uh, roughly split between Alaska Native representation, consultants, think tanks, and the environmental community. Um, we, uh, we met, uh, we, we we received the secretary's request. A study committee was formed. We developed a work plan uh, that looks uh, kind of like the one shown on the right-hand side and tested that with the Secretary of Energy before we undertook our work. 
The report itself is split into three parts. The first part is prudent development, and that includes a global perspective, global resource potential, in, including the U.S. onshore, offshore, with a focus on conventional oil and gas. It also includes uh, some, doc some inter interesting facts with regard to the oil industry's long history of experience in Arctic and Arctic-like conditions. It also includes policy, a description of Arctic policy history in the U.S., and it compares and contrasts U.S. Arctic policy with other nations. We describe in, at a high level what exploration and development in the Arctic might take and what some of the challenges and opportunities might be other than technology. That's part one. Parts two and three are the majority of the report. It's a 550 plus page report, and those are the research and technology sections. There's an engineering section that includes four chapters uh, that covered ICE, uh, exploration and development technology, logistics and infrastructure, and the very important topic of oil spill response. And then the environmental section includes ecology and the human environment. These two teams assess the current state of technology, the current state of ongoing research, assessed gaps, and then uh, selected opportunities for the current administration and the Department of Energy to pursue. Those opportunities were prioritized and the most important ones highlighted in the executive summary for consideration. A very, very collaborative report, a broad and deep team that came together to have conversations first, do analysis, and then come to conclusions. We worked for more than a year. We did not start putting pen to paper on recommendations until the last two months of the study. The next uh, uh, topic is uh, that, that I, I said I wanted you to take away is that the U.S. Arctic uh, potential is significant and the technology exists to explore for and develop it safely today. And I'm going to develop that a little further in the next five minutes or so. There are seven key findings in the report in the executive summary. Uh, you can see them, them listed and summarized on this page. And uh, the order is important. It was, this is first and foremost a technical report, and the order follows a logical technical order. In finding one, we describe the size of the Arctic oil and gas resource potential. And I'm going to tell you just a little bit more about that in a subsequent so slide. In finding two, we explored the Arctic ecological, physical, and human environment, which we found was well understood after decades of research from many different institutions uh, and organizations. In finding three, we explore the oil and gas industry's long history of successful operations in the Arctic, which has been enabled by continuing technology advances. More than a century of experience that starts with the very cold water development in Norman Wells in, in Canada and then moves forward to the Cook Inlet in the U.S., exploration programs in the U.S. and Canadian Beaufort Seas in the 70s and 80s, and then moves into the development rain beginning in uh, roughly the mid-1990s through to the present day. In finding four, perhaps the most important in the study, or one of the most important, most, most of the U.S. Arctic conventional oil and gas potential can be developed using existing field-proven technology. Of course, we rec recognize that technical know-how is not enough. In order to move forward, the development must also be economically viable, as we discuss in Finding 5, and we must also have public confidence that the opportunity can be pursued in a prudent manner, uh, as Paula described earlier and as we describe in the report in Finding 6. We recognize that we're not there today in the U.S. with a public confidence, and we note in the report the shared responsibility between the oil and gas industry industry and the government in securing and maintaining this public confidence. And then finally, in finding seven, we outline the substantial recent technology improvements in the area of oil spill prevention and oil spill response in ICE. Those technology improvements have not yet been fully accepted in the U.S., which opens up the opportunity for collaborative research in the public forum, as Paula discussed, and we see those in the recommendations, which I'll show to you shortly. 
Briefly on resource potential, we use the U.S. Geological Survey's assessment, and in the pie chart on the left, you see their mean assessment. The total potential, total global endowment in the Arctic is 923 billion barrels of oil potential. Beginning at the 12 o'clock position and moving our way around to the 4 o'clock position, you see what roughly one-third is in produced and reserves entirely in U.S. and Russia. The uh, four o'clock position starts the discovered but not yet developed. There's no development plans on the books for those resources, about 100 billion barrels. And then the majority, look at that, 51% or 426 billion barrels of undiscovered potential in the global Arctic. The global Arctic, in fact, is the contains the world's largest accumulation of undiscovered conventional oil and gas uh, hydrocarbons. So uh, splitting that potential, that uh, global potential by country is shown on the right. You can see by inspection that uh, Russia is by far the largest holder of that global potential, but look who's second. It's none other than the U.S. Focusing on oil potential, we see that the oil potential in Russia and the U.S. is roughly equivalent and that the U.S. has more oil potential than either Canada or Greenland or either no, other than Norway. Um, so this illustrates the significant resource potential in the, in the global Arctic and then in the U.S. We uh, discuss in the report the question of why to pursue the Arctic now, and I think Paula ably covered that point. And then in uh, the third bullet on the slide, we talk about the national security and economic benefits associated with oil and gas development in the North. And for those of you that were here this morning to hear Senator Murkowski's remarks on the economic benefit of oil and gas development to local Ana Alaskans, I don't think I could say it any better than, than she did. But for those of you that like numbers, there's quite a lot of discussion in the report about the potential economic implications of an offshore development. I'd encourage you to take a look at that. This, uh, this particular display is, uh, illustrates the variability in Arctic ice conditions around the world. There is not one Arctic. In the first two columns in this table, we describe the Arctic environment. By environment, we mean length of open water season, ice type, and water depth. In the first column, you have a word description. In a second column, we have the examples around the world where that environment is found. The third column is the technology implications on oil and gas development. You can think of these as technology tiers, tier one being the first row and the roughly the easiest, although easiest is a relative term in an area as remote as the Arctic, and tier five being the most difficult from a technology perspective. You'll note immediately that there are pictures in tiers one, two, and three, and no pictures in tier four and five. That's because tiers four and five have not yet been proven. Not yet, I always say. I'm in the research business, and that's what we're working on now. The other item I'd point out to you is the red text illustrates where the U.S. potential is located. And uh, the majority of the U.S. potential, 90% of the undiscovered potential, is assessed to be in the Beaufort and Chuck G. Seas in less than 100 meters of water depth. And you can see the photos in Tier 3. There's exploration technology, which was demonstrated in uh, the 70s and in the 70s in the Beaufort and Can Canadian and U.S. Beaufort Seas. And then the development concept was demonstrated in offshore Sakhalin Island uh, in, the, uh, in the 2000s. In the 90s and 2000s. Uh, finally, with regard to uh, well control technology improvements, there's been significant improvement um, post the Macondo tragedy by the industry and also by the regulators. This particular display we call the bow tie for obvious reasons. At the center of the bow is a loss of containment event, and on the left-hand side are all of the prevention technologies available to uh, eliminate or reduce the risk of a, of a well containment event occurring in the first place. And usually these topics, oil spill prevention and oil spill response, are separated, and the prevention side is the engineering domain, and the response side tends to be an environmental domain domain. In our report, we brought those together because it's the industry's objective, it's the objective of all stakeholders to, to prevent these terrible incidents from ha taking place in the first place. 
I'll direct your attention to the picture of the capping stack and seabed emergency shut-in device. These are the new technologies that I mentioned that have re been recently developed, and uh, we see the need for additional collaborative research to validate these technologies, which the industry views as proven, and adopt them for full use in the U.S. Finally, uh, with regard to what comes next, I've highlighted, as, as promised on this chart, the key recommendations coming out of the report, the key technical recommendations. Um, we, have, uh, we have grouped the recommendations into three themes, environmental stewardship, economic viability, and government leadership and policy uh, coordination. These themes are the three pillars, if you will, of what's necessary to move forward with the development. The first two listed are in the environmental stewardship theme. The first is that industry and regulators should work together to analyze these new technologies for well control. The second speaks to oil spill response in ICE, and there is an industry, industry collaborative research project that's been underway since 2012 uh, that has been evaluating response technologies developed in temperate climates to see how they will perform in the Arctic, and we recommend that government agencies form that, uh, join that collaborative. There are eight international companies uh, participating. Uh, in the area of economic viability, we make two recommendations. Uh, the first is uh, around extending the drilling season. The picture at the left illustrates the challenge. Currently, the drilling season is exploration drilling season is conducted in the winter or in the summer, excuse me, when the when the water is open and ice free. That's about 110 days. However, the current practice is to restrict the back end of that season from uh, exploration drilling to reserve it for a same season relief well. That re reduces the season to about 79 days. In order to drill an exploration well to target, you need about 80 days to progress it if you have a dry hole. If you have a test to do, you need more time. So what this current practice is doing is requiring two mobilizations for every single exploration well. What's possible with validating some of these technologies that I'm talking about that have been used and demonstrated in other jurisdictions and in the 70s and 80s in the U.S. is to roughly double that season. So it would make it possible to drill an exploration well in a single season with a single mobilization, taking the cost of exploration drilling almost in half and significantly reducing the risk. The second economic issue is lease terms. You can see in the picture that the U.S. is different than other nations in terms of its lease construct being a development-based system, which requires more drilling in the primary lease term to secure lease for development. Uh, other nations have recognized this challenge. It's very difficult to progress the number of exploration wells noted uh, when you can only work two to three months out of, the, out of the season during the summer months. And they've recognized this and they break the lease into a couple of bites. The first bite is an exploration lease where, for example, in Canada, if you have a discovery, you go into a process of converting that license to a significant discovery license, and then you're allowed more time with which to, do, to advance your development. So these are the key technical recommendations in the report, and I'd be pleased and look forward to your, to your questions. Thank you very much. Heather. Thank you, Carol. That was just super. And, and again, we have copies of the report. I just, a really tremendous amount of information is in there. So I encourage you to take it home and, and read it. And so may I turn to... You may, but yes, you pass me the... Oh, you have the, <laughs> the keyboard, keyboard. ma'am. Please. <laughs> Thank you. Our fancy technology here is passing down the row. All right, Ms. Pierce, the floor is yours. Just have to figure it out. Great, thank you very much. Thank you to CSIS. Thank you uh, to all of you for being here um, today. I'm going to talk about three things very briefly. Um, the NPC Arctic Research Study and an Alaskan's perspective, which I bring to the table. Um, Paula made the comment that it's important that any movements forward in the Arctic have the public's confidence. But what we Alaskans brought to the table was the fact that for this study, for it to have uh, any credence in Alaska, it had to have Alaskans' confidence. And so lots of Alaskans got to take, got to take part, and I was very pleased with the outcome. I'm going to talk briefly about one of the recommendations related to the Arctic Council and the U.S. Chairmanship, 
And I'm going to talk about the Arctic Economic Council, which you heard uh, the senator speak about earlier. So the senator told you to remember those four million people who live in the Arctic. I was honored to serve on the coordinating subcommittee, not only with uh, Heather and many people here in the room, but also with dozens of Alaskans who worked on the coordinating subcommittee, but also on the different chapter teams. Um, they brought their passion to the table. Henry Huntington of Pew, uh, doctor and then commissioner Mark Myers and his staff now at Alaska DNR, many, many scientists at the University of Alaska, particularly in Fairbanks, but also uh, throughout the state. And we had a workshop in Fairbanks where we brought in native leaders. We had tribal leaders. We had local government leaders. We had native corporation ANC leaders. We had elders. We had whalers. We had subsistence users. And the person who made sure that we kept on the right track and remembered those people who live in the Arctic each time we met uh, was my friend Richard Glenn. And just to give you an idea of all the different hats that the people, those four million people who live in the Arctic wear, not everyone wears all these hats, but Richard is the Executive Vice President for Lands and Minerals for Arctic Slope Regional Corporation, one of the largest of the ANCs. He is a geologist, he's a scientist, he's a father, he's a whaling crew co-captain, he's an Eskimo dancer, and he's a rock and roll keyboardist. He was also a member of the NPC Arctic Research Study Coordinating Subcommittee. And he spoke to us a lot, uh, but he talked a lot about balance. And so I put a quote here and I am going to read it to you. He said, the study, just like in Upiat Life, was all about balance. Balance between conservation and resource development. Balance between traditional knowledge and what we call Western science and engineering. The Arctic is our home. We aren't going anywhere. He talked to us many times, as did some of the elders, about the fact that the Inupiat uh, and the Yupik and the Aleut have been adapting to changing climates, to changing migratory patterns, and to the infusion of new culture and technology for thousands of years. They haven't left, and they're not going to leave. Another quote, if development comes, we want to share in the benefits while working to mitigate any negative impacts. Do we get passionate about it? You bet we do. And all the Alaskans who were at the table, whether working on one of the chapters or at the workshop or at the coordinating subcommittee, brought their passion to the table. We brought it back home to Alaska time and time again. And we insisted upon a focus on traditional knowledge. We insisted upon a focus on the benefits for Alaska. And I have to say that the ladies to my left were extremely patient with all of the Alaskans. So there is a recommendation uh, in the uh, executive summary uh, and in the study. <clears throat> um, the secretary asked in his letter about DOE's role during the Arctic Council chairmanship. And so in the government leadership and policy co coordination recommendations, uh, there is a recommendation and this is it. The U.S. government should seek to strengthen the Arctic Economic Council's formal interaction and engagement with the Arctic Council, as well as to promote its business advisory role. You heard the Senator speak about the Arctic Economic Council this morning, but a lot of people still aren't that familiar. So here's a primer. Uh, it was created at the direction of the ministers in the ministerial declaration during the Canadian chairmanship and under the leadership of Minister Leona Aglikuk, the Canadian chair of the Arctic Council, she represents the first time that a permanent participant, uh, an Inuit, has been chair. Their inaugural meeting was in September of last year in that place we just all don't quite know how to pronounce, but they have a lot of meetings, Iqaluit, Nunavut, Canada. Uh, the purpose is to facilitate Arctic business-to-business -business activities and responsible economic development. There are 42 voting members. That means there are three from each member nation and three from each of the Arctic Council permanent participant indigenous organizations, of which there are six. There's a four-member executive committee, and that will always include at least one permanent participant. This 
is the first time in an international body like this that was developed certainly under the Arctic Council that the permanent participants are fully at the table with a vote. Alaska is lucky, and the United States, but particularly Alaska is lucky because we have three business representatives who are from Alaska representing uh, all Alaskans, but we also have permanent participant representatives, one from the ICC, that's the Inuit, two from the Aleuts, one from the Athabascan International, and one from the Gwich'in International. So the U.S., Alaska, has eight of the 42 voting members, and that's the largest single delegation. On Tuesday of this week, the State Department held a virtual stakeholder outreach forum, and Julie Gorley presented to many, many people, many Alaskans in particular, um, a, a new slideshow about the road to Iqaluit and what the agenda is, and asked for questions, and, and uh, certainly the State Department wants the input. But I just want to note that under economic development, uh, the first bullet, is harnessing the expertise and resources of the Arctic Economic Council to inform the Council's work to improve economic and living conditions in the region. Now, I actually have some insider knowledge. I have reason to believe that when the group gets to Ottawa next Thursday, where they're having their second face-to-face -face meeting, that they will choose to adopt a rotating chairmanship, just like the Arctic Council has. I also have reason to believe that the U.S. will be the second chair after Canada, the chairs at the moment, of this new Arctic Economic Council. And I also have reason to believe that Tara Sweeney, who is the business rep for the um, Inuit Circumpolar Conference Alaska, will be, it, who sits on the executive executive committee uh, presently will be the chair uh, during the U.S. chairmanship. And the Alaskans uh, have met, they meet monthly, and they talk about what they hope that they can bring forward to the larger Arctic Economic Council, but they're bringing a number of proposed themes to the table next week, and I'm, I suspect because these fit so closely into uh, the terms of reference for the Arctic Econom Economic Council itself, that these will be adopted. So the overarching themes for the next two years, encouraging public-private partnerships, creating stable and predictable regulatory frameworks, facil facilitating knowledge and data exchange between industry and academia, establishing strong market connections between Arctic states, and traditional indigenous knowledge, stewardship, and a focus on small businesses and indeed on indigenous owned businesses. The senator you heard say she wants the AEC to go on the road. I believe that certainly the Alaskan members, the eight of them, will be very willing to do so here in the United States and will encourage the business reps from the other countries to do the same. Just so you know, uh, the AEC Alaska folks bring that same passion to the table that we had at the, during the study. So we will be very well rep represented. Thank you. Drew, thank you so much. And let me tell you, at CSAS, we always encourage insider information. So thank you. Thank you for that. that that's, a, that's terrific. And I think that really highlights what we're going to anticipate uh, next week. Just uh, taking the moderator's prerogative for a moment, just sort of my very brief reflections and being part of this uh, incredible process, my co-conspirator, I'm not sure he's here in the room, Frank Verastro, who's the senior vice president here at CSIS and holds our Schlesinger chair in energy, plopped in my office one day and he said, hey, would you like to be part of this National Petroleum Council Arctic Research Study? And I said, sure. He goes, Heather, it's a lot of work. And I'm like, yeah, okay. No, Heather, it's a lot of work. I was unprepared for the extraordinary amount of work, the people, the, you know, the numbers, the meetings. It was extraordinary. And you, you talk about passion. Um, but what was so interesting is we all came at, from it from a very different perspective. For me, it was so helpful to understand the private sector, the technology. I mean, I can't 
I could never understand the technology, but to have an appreciation for it. And to have the private sector have a, an appreciation, and quite frankly, to be totally frightened, about the policy environment in which these decisions are being made. And so it was an incredible learning experience, and I think some great colleagues were, were formed, and I think we're going to continue this conversation well after the study. Um, I have to say again, reflections from, from the peanut gallery. The, the Department of Energy requested this study, but in some ways this runs into what Senator Murkowski mentioned is sometimes the biggest challenge is us, the U.S. and the interagency process, because a lot of the conversation in these, in, 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 as part of the study was really about the Department of Interior. The Department of Interior was in these processes and was very engaged, but they, weren't, they didn't request the study. This was about the Department of Energy trying to understand its emerging role in the Arctic. But it, it, was, it, was, a, it was a part of the process that I think was very interesting um, to, to, to see and to witness and have everyone experience it, as well as getting that critical voice from Alaska. Again, we in the Washington policy community get so focused on our interagency fights and our regulation and who's doing what, and we've always been returned to what's important, and that's the people, and, and I was so grateful. Again, for my two cents, I think the larger question that this study raises, that it doesn't come out, but this is my takeaway from it, does the United States wants, want to develop its offshore Arctic resources? Do we or don't we? That's not an easy question to answer. And there are a lot of questions about economic viability. There are a lot of questions about uh, are we ready? Do we have sufficient infrastructure, search and rescue, oil spill prevention capabilities? Do we have what is necessary? And as we've all been watching Shell's journey, some may argue it's an odyssey of, of their efforts to do this. We've learned a lot uh, through that process. But I think increasingly we're understanding, and, and Drew, I was so grateful that you talked about the Arctic Economic Council because when the State Department first briefed their chairmanship agenda, I assure you the Arctic Economic Council was not at the top of that economic issue. They heard in stereo around the circumpolar Arctic that economic development had to be part of the conversation. And there was some reluctance, but I think we need to recognize they heard it and they're responding and we're being, so this is important. These voices matter, and we all have a piece of the conversation, and it takes the 200 plus people that came around the table through the vehicle of the National Petroleum Council study to say we've got a lot of work to do. So again, sort of the from the observation tower of this process, it was incredible, it's an incredible amount of work, and I just, I can't tell you, Paula and Carol have killed themselves the last 12 months uh, to, to shepherd this motley group uh, and get to a really incredible product. So I want to uh, thank you so much. So now I get to turn to some questions, and this is where I get to play a, a tough questioner here. Paula, I'd like you to, as much as you can share, um, sort of the challenge of you know, the interagency process here. DOE has a strong role. Uh, in this, but not the total role. Uh, and, and right before the, the study was completed, we had the Department of Interior uh, propose some new guidelines, some new regulations, and that sort of entered in at the end of it. How, what's your perspective on the interagency dynamic and your cooperative relationship with the Department of Interior as you work on these issues? Thanks, Heather. Um, the, we have a, an incredibly robust, um, as many of you are aware, interagency dialogue, but also an incredible amount of collaboration, um, particularly with the Office of Oil and Gas at DOE and the Department of Interior at various agencies, for example, in um, the aftermath of the Deepwater Horizon event. Uh, many of the, the learnings that have been taken up have been um, developed in collaboration with our uh, office, as well as the Research Partnership for a Secure Energy America, which involves about 140 companies and technology firms. Um, Likewise, we have, uh, as part of the, as directed by the President's Blueprint for a Secure Energy of Future, which calls for an all of the above energy strategy, we have a multi-agency strategy for understanding and working to develop the science to mitigate the impacts of unconventional oil and natural gas production. And this is with our office and USGS and EPA. And likewise, you see the recommendations that are uh, pointed to DOE in this report 
really point back to that, that, the, that role for the Arctic as well. In one way, the way I think about the work of, the, of our office is we're the Office of Science for federal and state regulators. We're in Alaska last week, and I can tell you state regulators in Alaska are very much focused on these questions of understanding what the science says in an unbiased and neutral manner about how this activity can proceed. And those are the same questions that our partners are asking at other federal agencies. And we're the office that they turn to understand what the center of the science says. And it's a vital role that government research plays in providing policymakers with an unbiased view of science technology and its performance so that we can move forward in these areas. So there's a very robust collaboration between our office and other agencies. And the recommendations here provide us sort of a roadmap forward on what we should be looking at next in the area of science and technology. Carol, what surprised you the most about this study? You went into this, and I think, I think if, if I may, I might tell my little tale out of school, I think Carol was, was surprised at the world of Washington policy sausage making, a Canadian herself, she was looking at this going, why do you do that? Well, why does that happen? And I, I love that because it was hard to explain why. But what, what took you by surprise the most about the study? Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, it's, hard to pick, it's hard to pick one thing. Uh, I guess uh, what, I, what I would say I mean, you, you hit on it, Heather. We just learned, those of us in the industry, I think, just learned a lot about, uh, about the history of Arctic policy and also about the challenges in, um, in integrating uh, the, many different, the many different aspects of Arctic policy that are important to all stakeholders. Um, I, I would say, that when we came together to undertake this question, each of us probably came to the table with our own perspective of what was most important. And I think, truthfully, each of us from our own corners of, of the room, so to speak, were thinking of this, Heather, uh, pretty simply. Um, and, and as we conducted the dialogue over, over those many months, the, the scope of the problem started small and got bigger, and then and then we tried to to synthesize and and bring it together in a in a meaningful way. So um, I, I mean, I just I just learned so much in terms of the importance of of listening fully and not letting your own biases uh, stop you from from hearing what someone else was trying to say. Um, I learned that. Uh, that the ExxonMobil project management culture sometimes clashes with, uh, with uh, you know, very focused on, on, on schedule and execution, sometimes clashes with uh, fulsome debate, and, and, uh, and we, we learn to tolerate uh, the strengths that each of us brought to the team. But, but what, I, what I would say is, is we started out this journey together with people saying, well, hello, I'm, I'm Paula Gant from the Department of Energy, and I'm Carol Lloyd from ExxonMobil, and I'm uh, Dr. Michael McCrander from, from Shell. And along the way, we moved from being individuals representing our respective interests, and we became a team that was about uh, trying to really understand the secretary's question and understand the broader context behind his question. So, uh, you know, I, I'm very pleased with what we delivered. And if I look back on, on what helped us be successful, I, you know, others will judge whether they think this is successful or not. A critical, two critical success factors. One was establishing a very transparent schedule, which we agreed with the with the secretary early on, and the second was the selection of the right team at the coordinating subcommittee. Leaders like you are in the room with us today and are sitting at this table with me. I'm just incredibly grateful for, for everyone's support and the opportunity. Thanks so much, Carol. Drew, I'm gonna ask you a question. That actually, I would have loved to ask Senator Murkowski, and we just ran out of time. I, I want you from the state perspective in your legislative career, the Alaskan state economy has really been battered. Uh, while on the one hand we can celebrate low energy prices, uh, boy, the budget has taken a hit. This is, I, this is an urgency in Alaskan voices about their future economic growth model and concerns I think that Senator Murkowski expressed about as North Slope oil production declines, needing to find new opportunities, having legislation, uh, White House, you know, 
pooling offshore, mm -hmm. onshore uh, 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 land away uh, from exploration. What's the mood? What's the sense? Uh, and uh, tell us, because what, what's going to be interesting, the next two years, there are going to be a lot of meetings with the Arctic Council, the senior right. Arctic officials. They're all going to be in Alaska. They are going to hear an Alaskan perspective on this. And I'd like you to preview that perspective. Well, it'll be loud. It'll be loud. <laughs> um, you know, the legislature is supposed to adjourn uh, under statutory requirements Sunday night at midnight. And I'm not sure that they're going to get out of town on time. One of the things that is battering us in particularly, particular at the moment is the fact that that throughput in TAPS is down so low at this point, running between around 500,000 barrels a day from the original 2 million barrels a day. In the past, including when I was chairing the Senate Finance Committee and oil dropped all the way down to $9.50 a barrel, even though the state budget depends over 90 percent on the revenues that we get from our oil and gas uh, resources and from the production of those resources, we were able to actually get through those times of really low oil prices because we had a robust throughput in taps, frankly. We've seen uh, production come back up in Cook Inlet. That's excellent, but that continued drop in taps is really battering the budget and will continue to for the future until we can uh, figure out a way to get more oil into what is not just an, uh, an Alaska important infrastructure, but it's a national energy security infrastructure that needs to be protected for the nation's benefit, not just for Alaskans. Um, the mood is somber, but Alaskans uh, are resilient. Goodness knows uh, so many Alaskans um, have, as I said, they've been there for thousands of years and uh, they've been adapting. Uh, for that entire time. So there's a re resiliency, but there's also, um, I would say, a hopefulness that together Alaskans can come through, make some changes to our base budget, but also see opportunities in the future that will help provide continued jobs uh, for Alaskans and for our children and grandchildren, but also support that budget. It's never bad to look at budgets and see where there may be some bloat, and that is happening, but the legislature and the governor will be careful not to try to go too deep. The former lieutenant governor is smiling at me. <laughs> I, I, I sense Mead may have a question when we turn to the audience, but infrastructure is exactly where I wanted to go. And Carol, I, I wonder if you could, because the report did have a reflection on infrastructure, if you could just share a brief thought on that. And, and Paula, you have been focusing on transportation and infrastructure, and that's obviously from shale gas, and I, I just would love your reflections after Carol on, on this question of infrastructure national prioritization. So uh, we do have a, a, an entire chapter in the report dedicated to uh, logistics and infrastructure and recognize it's a, it's a significant challenge to progressing with the development in the Alaskan Arctic. Uh, with regard to inf uh, exploration, the infrastructure needs are much lower, and uh, as uh, as the industry moves forward with as Shell moves very forward with their plans, uh, they will be bringing all the required equipment with them in order to safely and, and responsibly execute that program, including all the oil spill response uh, vessels and and support that that they have uh, submitted to the regulator and and, and they're required to bring by permit. With regard to the longer term infrastructure needs, uh, the report does a very good job of cataloging the current uh, state of infrastructure, what's available today, what the gaps and opportunities are, and, and then make some recommendations to move forward. Probably the most important one is that we see merit in uh, continued emphasis on joint scenario planning, including uh, the federal government, the state government, the local communities uh, probably most importantly, and they likely would be in, be in a best position to lead such an activity, the oil and gas industry, but also transportation, fisheries, tourism, et cetera. Infrastructure is a, is a shared resource, and so a joint scenario plan could potentially open up the opportunity for partnerships in particular areas between governments and industry, public-private partnerships, as, as the Senator was talking about earlier. Sure, thanks, Heather. Um, here in the lower 48, uh, we talk a lot about the shale 
revolution and uh, the knowledge that we have really great rocks and that, that comes in really handy. But the other reason that we're the envy of the world is that we have an incredibly robust delivery infrastructure. We have 2.4 million miles of natural gas pipeline alone. And nowhere else in the world will you find infrastructure so prevalent. So with this in mind, uh, the President has commissioned the Quadrennial Energy Review, that will be released very shortly, and the first year is focused on, um, on delivery infrastructure uh, for energy and understanding uh, what our needs are as a nation going forward in an integrated manner. And uh, in that, in the, as, you, as that begins to roll out soon, you'll, you'll see, uh, I think a key learning from that is that energy infrastructure, that the, the infrastructure that secures our energy the delivery is not just pipes and tankers, um, it's ports, it's roads, it's bridges, it's all part of uh, what underpins our economy, um, whether here in the lower 48 or in Alaska. Um, and uh, hence you see an incredible focus in the Senator's remarks this morning, as well as uh, last week on a visit to Alaska. A tremendous, I mean, there was a great deal of priority and debate being focused on a natural gas pipeline, for example, in Alaska, as well as the future of TAPS and how to ensure it. And um, it's sort of, it's, it goes hand in hand to develop the resource. You have to have uh, the uh, knowledge that you can move the resource to markets where it's valued, whether in Alaska or are in other places. So um, there will, this all combined with the changing nature of the climate and new challenges that we are seeing with regard to mitigating the impacts of climate change on coastal communities and uh, ports as well as roads and uh, whether they're traditional uh, roads or ice roads and new, and new challenges with being able to build and maintain them uh, as well as the pipeline infrastructure. This is something I think um, we're going to be discussing quite robustly over the coming years because there are tremendous investments that we need to make um, as onshore as well as offshore in thinking about data and communications as well as um, in uh, se securing maritime shipping lanes um, and, and the port support that would provide for oil spill response, response for example. So um, this is the age of infrastructure, and uh, we, we should all be very focused on thinking about all the ways that we can support the development, because this is the underpinning for our economic and energy security. Well said. All right, it's time for the audience to engage uh, in the discussion. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please raise your hand and give us your name and affiliation. If you're too shy, Mead, I'm going to put you right on the spot. So uh, I think I'm going to put Mead Treadwell right on the spot. L former Lieutenant Governor of Alaska, if we can have a microphone right here, please. Thank you. I'll introduce you so you don't have to, Mead. Thanks, Heather. Uh, my affiliation is uh, Heather and I are working on a World Economic Forum uh, effort on bringing investment to the Arctic, and I'm pleased to be here today. And thank you for your report. I'm sorry I missed your presentations in Alaska last week. Uh, as a former chair of the U.S. Arctic Research Commission, we, uh, I, I can tell you one of my last meetings as chair was at the White House just about the time the Macondo spill was happening, where we had come with some constructive suggestions on how the U.S. could better structure its support for oil and gas oil spill, or oil spill research. Uh, what did you find as you looked at both the public-private partnership that's happening in, in Norway uh, on oil and ice recovery, and what should we be doing specifically to structure and fund our research program uh, to meet the, the goal where you saw deficiencies here in this report? Uh, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, Oil spill prevention and response is the top topic on the mind of all stakeholders. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I mentioned in our recommendation um, that we really want and need to see uh, the Department of Interior, specifically Bessie, join with the industry in collaborating in this important area, like the example that you, you cite in, in Norway. Um, for, for two reasons. The first is that Bessie has spent a lot of money in the area of oil spill response in the Arctic, and they have a lot to bring to the table. Uh, they have a lot of expertise. And the second is that they are, importantly, independent of the industry. It's not enough for the industry to say that this particular response, uh, dispersants, et cetera, perform this way. We really need that independent view. Um, what we think needs to happen is for the Department of Interior to join that group, bring their research to the table, 
Um, we need to move forward with uh, field tests uh, in Arctic conditions. Some of those have been advanced in other countries, but getting permits to do a, a field test of an oil spill response exercise is particularly difficult because no one wants to, to champion that. So uh, we also see a need to, to move forward with permits necessary in that regard. Um, there are discussions about building a, a specialized facility to test uh, oil spill response off the east coast of Canada and Newfoundland as part of some of the research collaborations there. So those are just a couple of thoughts about, about what can be done in that very important area. Um, just quickly, I would just note DOE um, has, since Macondo, uh, focused our research uh, to a great extent on prevention of loss of controls, because we do a lot of work on well bore integrity, understanding how your cement performs at, pre at pressure and depth, understanding meta-ocean currents and the stresses that put on risers, and translating that into um, our work in basic material science to understand what the risers are made of, for example. Um, there's also, in the, I think, in the, in the study, uh, some, some recommendations that we'll be considering next. So we've been focused on the front end of the bow tie, if you will, but there's also some opportunities on that right side of that bow, bow tie, as Carol uh, set out, for us to work with the Department of Interior through our National Labs Network to demonstrate the effectiveness of some of the technologies that are available to, to prevent or deal with loss of control of a well. So while today we've been focused on preventing that, that your, your, your best way to prevent a, an oil spill is to, is to design your well um, really well and never lose control of it to begin with. But if, but if you do, there, are, uh, there have emerged an array of technologies to deal with it. And what we need to do is make sure that we're demonstrating and testing those ways that people have, in ways that people have confidence in. So that's what we'll be looking at at DOE, how we can participate in that through our national labs. Thank you. One of the things that I learned, and I think one of the things that those of us who worked on the study who were neither uh, industry and or federal government, is that there's not as much collaboration as we might expect or think or just thought was happening. For example, industry uh, has an Arctic uh, joint industry project for spill response technology that the U.S. government is not party to. Why? I, mean, I was surprised by that, that they hadn't, uh, uh, that Bessie and Boehm and, and others had not actually joined. Um, so we saw lots of opportunities, and I think I came away with the belief that there needs to be um, better understanding uh, by everyone of all the work that is being done and all the work that has been done and the technology that is out there, whether we're practicing it and whether we're uh, exercising it as well as we should is a different question, uh, particularly in the U.S. where it's hard to get a permit to do a spell exercise. Um, but there's kind of a step two, which is education, which I think is something that um, CSIS and other institutions like that might want to focus on. How do, we, how do we get the word out there of what truly is happening? I would also say that I think it provides an opportunity for some of those public-private partnerships that we're talking about because it's not just industry and it's not just the government. There are private companies around the world that are working on spill technology every day and have some really bright minds working on it. So there are some real opportunities and we should push forward to make those work for us. I'll just add my two cents. The Arctic Council is, is the international perspective here. They have been working on oil spill prevention, uh, and I think in Callaway they will be presenting a framework for that, but it's going to be the U.S. chairmanship that's going to have to work that issue. Uh, I think in some ways the Arctic Council, its, its challenges, it does such amazing work, great assessments, the Arctic Mar Marine Shipping Assessment that me, you were very engaged uh, with fabulous recommendations, and then, okay, who makes sure that the national governments really focus, really implement those, bring those to fruition? And uh, this is going to be the challenge for the U.S., but there is a great deal of international collaboration. I think the Arctic Economic Council, correct me if I'm wrong, Drew, is going to have a big focus on energy uh, and, and those implications. Again, we're, we're, we're developing these good tools. We need collaboration. And just one final point. Um, Dr. Mark Myers, who, when we began the study, was at the university in charge of research, and when we ended the study, is now the Commissioner of Natural Resources for the state, told us time and time again that everybody can do all of their research at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, where they're actually building facilities for this type of research. So once again, bringing it home.
Do you have a quick follow-up, and then I will let others get in here. Yes, sir, we'll start with you then. Uh, no, go ahead, and we'll get a microphone. My point, my point about structure in the U.S. government is that... Uh, oh, no, no, here, just get a microphone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Oil Pollution Act of 1990 created an interagency committee on, on uh, coordinating oil pollution research. I think it's called ICOPAR. We, when I was there, as we founded it, we called it the intergalactic. But I, w I would really urge industry to play a much larger role in that committee. I would urge DOE on... Uh, to play a much uh, larger role on that committee, uh, understand the work of the Coast Guard because they've got the internal work. And the state of Alaska has put money toward the joint industry program. There is a way that we can come together. And if you, uh, you know, I find that the issue with oil spills is people who want to go ahead and drill want to pretend they don't happen. They can happen, we know they can happen, and we have to constantly be pushing that edge forward. And th that committee needs greater attention to the White House and it needs greater participation by the federal agencies. Uh, yes, Inuta Olsen from the Greenland representation. Um, one of the key findings um, was to secure public confidence in the development of oil and gas. And um, Senator Makowski was, um, you know, um, touching upon the aspect of, you know, residents in the Arctic being more, uh, who wants to see development while those outside, you know, wants to preserve it. So how do you address that given the opposition from especially many of the environmental NGOs? Well, <clears throat> I just want to point out one of the difficulties of trying to address it. So, you know, clearly you need public accept acceptance to move forward. But if you look at the um, accidents that have happened in terms of oil and gas related industry in Alaska and around the world, you'll find that most of those are related to transportation, not to exploration phase and not to development phase. However, when you look at the new Bessie Arctic regs that came out last month, Arguably, because of the timelines that are written into the regs, it pushes expiration wells into a two-season event. Rather than being able to go in, drill your well, and actually do your testing in one year, and then get out. If the real risk is during the transportation phase, it does not make sense to push you into two years where you've got to stage twice, up and back and up and back, because you've got more ships in the water and you have more opportunity to have one of those trans transportation uh, accidents. So I think that what we need is a dialogue to understand what are the real risks and what are the opportunities, and then we all have to accept that your risk is never going to be zero, just as Mead said. We don't live in a zero risk world. Uh, Henry Hedger, retired government researcher at NARA. Uh, perhaps you've heard of uh, bottling plants uh, for fresh water in Finland where they use icebergs. Uh, the Arctic has a tremendous amount of ice, and of course, with the climate change, they indicate it will melt. Once it's melted, it is no longer serviceable. It becomes salt water in the ocean. But the fresh water is a, a great resource, and bottling plants would be needed, say, in Alaska, one of our own areas, let alone Canada, if they can reduce the amount of ice that's fresh, all well and good, and then there'd be less of a problem with the uh, rising sea level. Also, there's job creation, thousands of jobs could be created, and not just bottles of water, but barrels of water could be shipped to areas of great concern like California, and you'd have fresh water. Do you have any comments? Oh my goodness, Drew, <laughs> go for it. You know, there was just an article in the Anchorage paper maybe yesterday, that freshwater shipments are starting out of Sitka, Alaska to the lower 48. Now, that's not Arctic water, uh, but it's water. It's fresh water. Um, so all the way back uh, to Governor Hickel, and Mrs. Hickel wouldn't like me saying all the way back, but um, Governor Hickel had the dream of, of bringing Alaska's freshwater resources south, and, and various entities have picked up on that and have actually licensed uh, some opportunities. I think you will see 
uh, people move forward. And looking at uh, the water resources that we have in Alaska as being a very important resource to the state. But we're seeing that right now as kind of a fledgling industry in Alaska. Hi, John Farrell, Arctic Research Commission. I have a question for Dr. Gant. Uh, Dr. Gant, um, I was curious why Secretary Mone's commissioned this study. And uh, so I'm curious, um, he, will, he will receive this report and he will provide a response to that report, his recommendations in the report. Is there anything that you can at this point foreshadow as regards to what he might say in response to receiving this report and how he may consider those recommendations and begin to act on them? John, you know I like my job and I'd like to keep it, so I'm not going to uh, be so bold as to, <laughs> as to suggest uh, what the secretary might say. I can tell you that um, he and the W secretary were very pleased with the quality of this report, and it provides, um, I mean, it's 550 pages, uh, a lot of great science is consolidated there, and we expect it will be a great resource for people as they come to the Arctic, um, particularly those like me that know a lot less about it than you do, John. Um, with regard to the record, there are um, a, a number of recommendations that re relate directly to DOE um, and where we might pursue science and research. Um, in almost all of those, um, not only do they speak to our core mission and our core capabilities, but they also are in, in implicitly uh, represent our collaboration with, with other agencies, as well as our work with ICAPAR and the, the work that, that the Commission has, has going on as well. So as the Secretary considers these recommendations and next steps, um, we will be working with our interagency partners and other federal partners that were involved in the study effort and the recommendations to understand not only which are the, the which piece of these recommendations seem, because we can't do everything at once, the, the most imperative and, and priority from a time perspective, um, but which should be done through vehicles like our national labs, which should be done in partnerships, direct partnerships with other agencies, which should be done through the Arctic Research Council or other, um, or other agencies, or through partnerships at, at the um, state level. As Drew mentioned, the University of Alaska Fairbanks has tremendous capabilities in this area, and they're already a, a great partner for us. So um, we'll be looking for input as we move forward, and, um, and I'll let the Secretary speak for himself when he does. Thanks for the question. I'd, I'd like to, to make a, a comment. I, I really appreciate the question as well. We want um, we want the report to to be read and, and, and have impact, but I want to integrate that question with the question we had over here on how to how to navigate the complex question that the sen that the senator laid out for us. Should we progress with development, or uh, and how do we balance that with concern for the changing climate? I, I, I think the answer is in a debate that's rooted in science and research, not the sound bites that come across on Twitter, not the statistics that are short quotes uh, without the technical data to back up what they mean. Um, you know, you, you, could, you could identify, in our report, we say the risk of a well-controlled event in the Arctic with new technology is extremely remote. How do I reconcile that with the quote that says, the risk of an oil spill is 70%. The risk of an oil spill this summer is not 70%. The data behind that calculation is that that risk is over the next 70 years. Now, people don't say that on Twitter, but what we really need to do is get the scientific community together, ICOPAR, uh, John's organization, the industry experts in oil spill response, Paula's team together to explore the, the findings in this report. Do you agree with them? If not, what more science and technology is needed in order to move forward? And, and as Paula outlined in her opening questions, only then can we have good science, good research, inform good policy. And that's how I think we can find some middle ground between these very polarized opinions and move beyond them being someone's personal opinion. 
Well, I'm, unfortunately, the time is close. I'm going to have to cut it off uh, here. But as you can tell, uh, what a privilege it was to be a part of a team of such thoughtful people uh, trying to wrestle with extremely tough, complex questions. And we know the stakes are enormous. I think when you showed Richard Glenn's quote, Drew, we have to have him here, a little Arctic rock and roll concert. I think we'll, we'll, we have to jazz up our next conversation on the future of development of the American Arctic. But please join me in thanking our panelists for a great presentation. Now, don't go away. We're going to very quickly switch panelists, and we're going to have, conclude with our Arctic health discussion. Thank you.